A travel warning from the U.S. State Department is in effect into the new year. According to the department's website, intelligence suggesting that greater vigilance should be uh, had around transportation systems. Travelers urged to be very aware of their surroundings and to report anything that may seem suspicious to authorities. The travel alert expires on February 24th. Now, people we spoke to at BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport say they really aren't changing their routines. Looking around, you know, I'm just trying to help out the security as much as possible, seeing if there's any suspicious activity, you know, leaving bags around, stuff like that. I've been kind of weary, like I said, but uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable, and uh, I, uh, I usually pay attention to my surroundings, so I'm not really afraid, but I am a little weary being the stuff that's going on. So I'm going to definitely live my life uh, with more alert uh, to know what's, to pay attention to what's going on, definitely, but I, I'm not going to live in fear or anything. I don't live in fear ever. The State Department is also working to get the word out more quickly about credible threats. The National Terrorism Advisory System replaced the color-coded system back in 2011. Under the new protocol, alerts of an elevated or imminent threat are sent out through email and social media. And speaking of social media, it's become a real game changer in promoting and fighting terrorism. Joining us now, James C. Foster, founder and chief executive officer of cybersecurity firm Zero Fox. Thanks for coming by. Good to see you. Thanks, Jason. Facebook and Twitter have really taken off in this uh, global terrorism threat. How are they being used, do you think, by some of these groups? Sure. Uh, they fundamentally changed the game for media distribution. Okay. Right? 10, 15 years ago, if I wanted to get my message out globally, I had the web to do that. Sure. Now I can do that through social. The difference is personalization. Hmm. I can take my message, take it global, and give it to you personally, as opposed to you stumbling on it, stumbling on a website and reading what I posted. Yeah, and, and the tease, we're saying that what's amazing about social media is that it's instant. The moment you type it, an eyeball has already seen it. That's right. And that it, it's a huge benefit for terror groups or anybody that wants to do recruiting sure. or even fundraising. Those are the two biggest things that I think we're still trying to wrap our arms around is how an individual or an organization can recruit globally via social media. Companies are doing it to get employees. You know, groups that we wouldn't want to grow in size are also doing it to, to uh, grow as well. Sure, and as it came out in the very beginning and it was, it was pretty harmless, we all loved it, but now we're looking for ways to safeguard it. How tough is that for a government or for a cybersecurity firm to do that kind of work? It's incredibly difficult, and there's a myth that people tweet they're, they're going to do bad things. Okay. That almost never happens. You don't sure. tweet out that you're about to do something bad, look for the tweet and then go, hey, they said they were gonna do this 30 seconds before. Yeah. However, the global communication network that's being built on top of these platforms is different. You don't need to make phone calls anymore. You don't need to send text messages. People can openly communicate to everybody in the world to, to, to push their agenda. Before the show, you made a good point. Yeah, you can push an agenda, but you can also fund that agenda as well. That's right, on the other side of the world. I mean, think about how social has changed our political campaigns and fundraising process. Millions and millions of dollars from people saying, I wanna give you $20, I believe in your cause. While there are other causes that are out there that are raising that type of money as well, that most Americans probably wouldn't agree with around the world saying, give me $100 to support this initiative. It's if, dangerous, it's fear, it's terrifying. If a company comes to you and say, hey, listen, Foster, I've got issues, someone's, you know, is hacking me, and I'm guessing you can send guys out to maybe do some trace work, to maybe trace it back. Right. Is it that easy for something like this when you're dealing with a, a terrorist group, say? No, it's really difficult to do that. And, you know, quite honestly, it's, it's near to impossible for the groups that are doing this well. Right? People that don't want to get found, it's really hard to find them. Sure. And especially with a lack of coordination. You mentioned in an earlier segment about having intelligence. Actionable intelligence is the key. Right? Having data is one thing. Mm -hmm. And then be able to take action is the most important thing that's out there. When there's data out there, of course, you, <laughs> the, the biggest thing would be to just eliminate that presence. Right. But I guess also there needs to be that breadcrumb trail, I guess, for investigators. Is that, is that a tough balance? I don't think you'll ever eliminate it. Yeah. If you have a motivated group or an adversary that's persistent, they're not going away just because you eliminate one communication channel. They'll find another. Sure. And so that will not stop. From your standpoint, as you watch the headlines, what's going through your mind as a cybersecurity expert? Like, what, what do you think? I think it's going to get more difficult before it gets better. Okay. Yep.